Hey, my name is Ken. Um, I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, as we dig in today's message, I'm excited to teach with you guys this morning and just invite you to open your outline up and get that ready to go. There's some places you can fill in the blanks and, and follow along with the message this morning and, um, and just take some notes. And so that'll be good. You know, in, in 2012, the Detroit Tigers made the postseason playoffs, and it was the last time they did. I, I couldn't be more thrilled uh, when they did. I, see, I'm, I'm a huge Tigers fan, if you don't know this about me. In fact, that season, 2012, I watched almost all 162 games on TV uh, that year. Uh, I went to six games that year. And uh, in person, you know, I get the cheap seats for like $5 a ticket. And I go and sit up in the bleachers and just enjoy my time there. But it was an amazing season. If you remember 2012, the Tigers, uh, they had Max Scherzer pitching and Justin Verlander. You probably remember him pitching. And of course, this guy, Miguel Cabrera, that was the year he got the triple crown, won the MVP. I mean, this team was stacked. And they, and they were going to the playoffs, and, and it was exciting to go. And, and so I actually got tickets for fairly inexpensive, cheap tickets for the first round of the postseason in October of that year. And I got to watch them uh, beat the uh, Oakland A's that year as, as they went on. And so I wanted terribly to go to the next round of playoffs, at least a game, to see them face off against the Yankees. And um, I really wanted to go, but tickets were sold out. And they cost like $400 a piece. So I didn't have that kind of money to even go to one of these games. But I had an idea. I thought for the last, it was the clinching game uh, that the Tigers could win the series. I thought, I'm going to go downtown and, and I'm just going to go and just show up. And maybe magically, on the ground, I'll find a golden ticket like Charlie in the Chocolate Factory and be like, I can go to the game. And, and, you know, and so I drove downtown and I parked and I walked all around. The game was happening and I'm looking. And I bet you think I found a ticket. I didn't. No ticket for me. But I decided instead, I was there downtown. I, I went to the park anyway. And you see, outside of the outfield, there's these large iron bars. In this picture, you can see them back here in the back corner right here. That really, they're there to keep the riffraff like me out of the park. Uh, people don't pay $400 a ticket. So I, I, I decided, if I stand on the ledge, I can hold on to this iron bars. And I stood there, and I watched the Tigers sweep the Yankees for the championship series for free, uh, watching it there on the Iron Bars. I was downtown Detroit. It was an amazing, amazing day, and I'll never forget it, you know. Uh, that, that was my whatever-it-takes attitude when it came to seeing the Tigers in the playoffs. You know, it, it, when I was thinking about this, it, it's the same passion and attitude that we should have to get people to hear the life-changing message about Jesus, to do whatever it takes. And so today I want to give you this charge right off the bat. It's the main idea that you can fill in on your outline, and we'll kind of unpack it here. But the main idea today is this. Do whatever it takes to share Jesus with others. Do whatever it takes. Now, as you're writing this down, one caveat. Don't sin. You know, don't, don't like, I'm going to cheat somebody into the, you know, that's not going to, that's not what Jesus wants. You know, do anything outside of sinning to get people to know who Jesus is. We have to have this whatever it takes attitude. Yeah, I, I want to read an account of one man's encounter with Jesus here in the Gospel of Luke. We're going to be in Luke chapter 5. So if you have a Bible, you want to open up to Luke chapter 5, uh, that would be great. I have to tell you, I already spoke this message uh, to our fantastic Stony Creek students. Um, yes. It's like I got the cheer crowd down here. Yeah, over there. Yeah, and so, so you guys might hear this and you're like, wait a second, this sounds familiar. Well, it's good to review, good to think through this with different lens. But, you know, in fact, last week, my son was in Bible quizzing 
was quizzing on this passage. And as he was studying it the, the weeks earlier, he said, hey, Dad, th this is just what you preached in SES, which I was thrilled because, number one, it means he's in the Bible memorizing, studying God's Word, right? But number two, it means he was listening to me when I was preaching it in SES. So, so, so it's, it's great to know that. Um, and so because of that, because they just study this in Bible quizzing, I'm going to use the BSB version, which is what the Bible quizzers use. It's the Berean Study Bible. And so it might be a little different than your physical Bible that you have, but it's on your outline. It'll be on the screen here as well. And if you have your own Bible, you might notice some of the differences, but that's okay. Uh, let's start Luke chapter 5 in verse 17. And when we come to these yellow print, I just want to invite you to read that along with me. Here we go. Chapter uh, 5 verse 17 starts. One day, Jesus was teaching, and the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. People had come from Jerusalem and from every village of Galilee and Judea, and the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Now, before I go on, I want to set the stage for this, what's going on in this moment. Luke is chronicling Jesus' uh, burgeoning ministry that is happening. He's going around, Jesus is, that is, preaching and teaching and healing and casting out demons and and really performing miracles and so of course people are like who is this Jesus I got to hear him and they're coming out of everywhere to find out wherever Jesus is on tour I'm going to be at that stop and so uh so people are swarming him I love I love the way Mark uh tells us the same account of this passage, Mark chapter 2, verse 2. You don't have to flip there, but you can see it on here. Uh, he says this, he says, Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. And Mark gives us a better, little better description about how full and packed this environment was. You know, the last few months here at Stony, um, we've, we've been filling up like there's a lot of people sitting in the chairs here and especially at the 10 a.m. service uh, the one before this one there was almost every chair was filled now I'm going to tell you this this isn't what I took note on but I was noticing this morning you know they fill the chairs but you guys sing I mean this room was like you know I exalt thee. you guys were singing it was great to hear us standing down front hearing you guys sing so so that's great there's some empty chairs here this morning that's that's okay it's good to make some space for other people. But um, a few weeks ago, I was, I was running the camera back there in our tech booth. Let's go tech people back there in the booth. And, and I was running there. I was kind of like, I, I had to be doing the camera. And I saw two families come in. And during the time of singing worship, they were a family of four. And the next one was a family of six. And they stood there and they looked. And they looked. And they couldn't find a place for their family to sit down. So they looked for a while, they looked for a while. Now, our amazing ushers eventually went out and grabbed some chairs. Sometimes you probably hear it. You hear that bum, 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 moving, banging up chairs. They're setting up an extra row for, for these people that are coming in late. You know, but, but it's great to just know that, that we're seeing so many people come. But still, even so, we've got some empty chairs. So picture with me, every chair this morning is full. There's somebody seating, seating, sitting in it. And everybody's here. That, I mean, that'd be an amazing space, right? Now imagine, take it one step further, that there's so many people here that when people came in, there was no seat, so they had to stand. So they're standing in the back. They're willing to stand and just, and just listen and see what's going on. And they're so packed that you can't even open the back doors. I mean, that's what's going on here with Jesus. Is they, were, they were packed in because they wanted to see and hear what Jesus was teaching. So with that in mind, we'll, we'll, we'll keep reading verse 18 back in, in Luke chapter 5. Verse 18, it says, Just then, some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. Help me. They tried to bring him inside to set him before Jesus, but they could not find a way through the crowd. So they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles in the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. You see, these guys, they were not going to let anything get in their way of bringing their friend to Jesus. They wouldn't let any obstacles. In fact, you can write this down in your outline. When we have a whatever-it-takes attitude, 
the first thing to note is that you won't let obstacles get in your way. You won't let obstacles get in your way. These guys that brought their friend, they were rejected at first. They couldn't get in. There's no way. Then, then I, I imagine one of them was like, hey, guys, I got an idea. Let's, uh, let's take our friend here. This shouldn't be too hard and lift him up onto the roof. And, and, then, and then we can just like break the guy's house and, and, and lower him down the roof. And who's got some rope? I'm sure that they didn't have even rope on them. Like, I don't know how they went about this. But they were not going to let anything stand in their way of getting this man to Jesus. Now imagine Jesus standing there, teaching the people. They're leaning in on every word he's saying. And all of a sudden, some dust falls from the ceiling. <laughs> more, more, more. Till finally, you know, it's dark. There's no electricity in there. There's no, like, candles or nothing. And so this beam of light comes from the ceiling. And it's like, like, poof. And the, everybody looks up and they watch this man get lowered down from the roof. And you know, every picture I found on internet, it looks like, oh, they were just this like well-organized machine. I don't think it was that easy. I'm thinking that they were like, you know, lo lo lower, 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 not too fast, not too fast, you know, uh, pivot, pivot, you know, they're probably trying to get them, you know, in the right spot and everything. And, you know, but these guys did not let anything get in their way. Check out verse 20. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. You know, circle that phrase, their faith. That's, that's, a, that's a unique way that Jesus says this. Now, before I talk about this, I want to be perfectly clear that Jesus alone has the power to save us. No one can make the decision to turn your life to following Jesus. Your, your, your wife can't make it for you. Your grandma who brought you to church when she was, you know, when you were young, she didn't make it for you. Your brother or sister, your pastor, no one can make the decision to follow Jesus for you except you alone. It has to be your decision. With that said, don't you find it interesting that Jesus said he saw their faith, and because of that, he forgave the man's sins? You can write this down, and then we'll unpack it. You play a role in your friend's salvation. You play a role in your friend's salvation. Uh, again, let me, let me be clear. That doesn't mean that you save the person. I've heard a lot of times that, like, oh, so-and-so, they, they saved me. No, 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 no. They didn't save you. Jesus does the saving. But you play a role in that. Your faith matters. You have to have faith to share the gospel. You have to have faith to, 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 to trust that your friend is going to respond to that invitation. You have to have faith to be praying that the Holy Spirit is leading them in that direction. You play a part, a big part, in the people around you coming to know Christ. In fact, think about the time when, when you first trusted in Christ. If you would call yourself a Christian, you can probably think back to that moment that you trusted in Christ. It might have been 40 years ago. It might have been two years ago. Whatever the case, there was a moment when you trusted in Christ. I would almost guarantee that someone else helped you along that to make that decision. You know, maybe they shared the good news of, this, of Jesus Christ with you and you responded to that. Maybe, maybe they helped you pray and they said, you know, pray like this. Or, or maybe, maybe there was nobody around, but there was somebody praying for you that you didn't even know was going on. See, it's only extreme circumstances do people ever come to faith in Christ without anyone else bringing them along. So I want you to see how huge it is that you play a part in your friend's salvation. I, I want to encourage you to see that you can't just idly sit by and expect someone else to do your part. You can't just sit back and say, they'll experience Jesus on their own. You have to have faith to do whatever it takes to bring people to Jesus. The, the passage in, in Luke continues in verse 21. 
It says, but the scribes and Pharisees began thinking to themselves, who is this man who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? You know, before I go much further, let's, let's, let's zero in on these Pharisees a little bit. You know, if you remember, all the way back in verse 17, they were introduced to us. It said the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. Here's a quick side thought. Remember, this is standing room only. No seats are available. But these Pharisees, these teachers of the law, they were very well respected. They were typically looked at like they were celebrities. So I'm guessing they came in with their large robes and big hats and, you know, the vestments and stuff. And they didn't want to get them all dirty, so they probably, you know, sat down and had some space around themselves. And they, they were, were comfortable. Heaven forbid they become uncomfortable so that somebody else could come into the door. Now, as a, as a bonus learning for today, kind of aside, I don't ever want to be like these Pharisees or teach the law personally. I want to do whatever it takes to make more space for more people. And I would pray that as a church, we don't want to be like the Pharisees and get comfortable and say, eh, eh, we, don't want, we don't want more people. That makes it difficult on me. You know, uh, Sunday mornings, myself, I know Chris is always here early. The band shows up, uh, the tech people. And we show, up, we show up way before you guys, you 1130 people. <laughs> but we show up about 7, 8 o'clock in the morning. Nobody else is here. And yet, pretty much all of us, we park over at Weingart's, pretty much the furthest away. Why do we do that? Because we want to save the best parking spaces for you, for maybe somebody who doesn't know but they're, they're, they're checking out the church for the first time. We want to make sure that there's an obvious place where they can find a space to park. And it's not taken up by, you know, the best pastor in the world spot or anything like that. We want to make sure that there's space for anybody. All right, that, that was kind of a side. We're going to go back to verse 22 here. Uh, verse 22. It says, knowing what they were thinking, I'm going to pause again here. I know I'm doing this a lot, but, but notice this, this phrase here appears a couple times. At verse 21, it says, thinking to themselves. You could underline that if you want to. And then later on, it says, knowing what they were thinking right here. You see, you notice these guys, these Pharisees, they didn't even voice their opposition out loud. Jesus knew what was going on in their minds and their hearts continues on Jesus replied why are you thinking these things in your hearts goes on the next verse 23 which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say nice but so that you might know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins gonna finish this in just a second uh, just to note this is this is spot on. I mean, Jesus gives us the obvious. He's pretty smart here. He's like, okay, guys, what's easier to do? Uh, to say these, you know, your sins are forgiven. You can't test me on that. Or to actually make this man healed from a disease he's been stricken with his whole life and you can physically see the obvious uh, healing. But what I want you to see and hear is how these religious leaders really how they heard this statement. The first is, from a, from a culturally religious perspective of the day, it was these Pharisees and teachers of the law that were given the, really the religious right ability to absolve sins of the people. The people would uh, go to them and they would make a sacrifice, do a, a ceremony, and they would call them forgiven of their sins. And, you know, it was their, their God-ordained ability, these Pharisees, to be able to do, these, do this for the people, the scribes, the, the, the leaders here. But because of that, this is where they derive some power over the people. And so oftentimes they would use and overuse that power. So you can imagine Jesus just waltzing in here and saying, oh, your sins are forgiven. That's going to like, that's going to rub these guys the wrong way. That's going to ruffle their fetters because, hey, that's my job. You can't do that. But then, but then even more importantly, 
Notice this, this phrase Jesus used, the Son of Man. If you, you might want to circle that in your outline there or in your Bible. This is a phrase that Jesus uses often throughout the whole uh, New Testament here. It has a deeper meaning than just something we can just read through and run through. It's a callback to the Old Testament to the book of Daniel, which these Pharisees and teachers of the law and scribes would greatly know. They would know this when they hear it. It's a callback to a verse referenced in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. You can just write that on your outline there. You don't have to, to flip there if you don't want to. But um, the, that passage, in that passage, the prophet accounts that a son of man, that's where that phrase come from, comes on the clouds to join the ancient one and was given authority and power over everything. See, what Jesus is doing in this statement, he is saying, I am that deity with the authority of the ancient one. This phrase is loaded, especially to these Pharisees and these teachers of the law. Now, we're almost to the end of the passage, but uh, you see, it's, you know, this is rich. It's a detailed story here. It's not just something simple we can just read and, and move on from. Uh, if you keep reading in the passage, he, uh, Jesus said to the paralytic, he says, I tell you, get up, pick up your mat, and go home. So Jesus does the miracle he was just talking about. And think of the man on the mat in this moment. He's like, oh, my sins are forgiven. Oh, now I can walk. Now I can get up. Now I can, I'm free from this, this torment that I've been in my whole life. This healing brings freedom that he's never experienced before. In fact, you can write this down on your outline. When we have this whatever it takes attitude, you experience Jesus' real freedom. Let's not miss out on the fact that there is a result here when the people bring their friend to Jesus. He gets healed. But also remember what Jesus said earlier. He forgave him his sins. And this is truly where the real freedom is found. I imagine Jesus prioritized forgiveness of sins over fixing this man's physical problems. You see, the real freedom we receive from Jesus is from the effects of sin. Sin will leave us feeling pain and guilt and shame. And when we receive forgiveness, we can be freed from these emotions that bring us down. But even bigger than that, the overall effect of sin is eternal separation from God in hell. You see, when a person chooses to live their life separated from God, then they will also be separated from him in eternity. And that's not good. Some people are like, you know, people who don't trust in Christ are like, uh, I'm going to go to hell because it's going to be a party there. That's where all the party people go, and it's going to be fun, and we don't have to worry about stuff anymore. No, don't buy that lie. Hell is extreme. It's Tor torment. It's separation from anything that is ever good and pleasurable and joyful. God alone is where we can find our hope and our peace. And Jesus offers us that through a life following him. You see why that is so much more important than being freed of your par being paralyzed. Now, I, I tell you this because I don't want you to get the wrong idea that following Jesus you follow him and instantly all your pain is gone and, and you know, you can now, you know, you have, uh, uh, you're healed of your diseases or your weaknesses or your emotional struggles. It doesn't, that's not what Jesus is saying here. You know, sometimes those, those pains, those difficulties in life, they hold us back from fully trusting in Jesus. We say, oh God, why would you let me suffer with this or that? When in reality, Jesus is saying, I've got so much more for you in all eternity. So much bigger than, than just your physical here and now. Freedom that Jesus offers is greater than anything we could ever experience today.
So this conclusion uh, to this passage comes in the last two verses here. We're verse 25. It says, And immediately the man stood up before them, took what he had been lying on, and went home glorifying God. Help me out. Everyone was taken with amazement and glorified God. They were filled with awe and said, We have seen remarkable things today. Did you catch that? They glorified God. They worshiped God because of this amazing thing. I love how the room celebrates what God is doing. In fact, that's the the last fill-in here you can write down on your outline, is this, the community sees the power of God. When you have a whatever-it-takes attitude, the community around you gets to see and experience the power of God. I want you to see that the way we celebrate and the way we welcome in new people, it can make all the difference in their spiritual journey. If someone is new here, we shouldn't be looking and saying, oh, they're sitting in my spot or, oh, you know, they're, uh, I don't know half the people here anymore. This place is different. No, we should be celebrating and praising God for what he is doing in our midst. Every new person should, should renew our faith and help us celebrate God. So what do we do with all this? I want to give you some, some, practical, uh, some practical tips. And I know how it is. Uh, you filled in all your blanks on your outlines. So you probably shoved it back in your Bible or put it in your purse, right? All right, there's some more information on there you might want to take a look at. You just don't have blanks to fill in. That's okay. You can still take a look at them. But I want to give you some tips on, on how to do how to apply this, how to do whatever it takes. Number one, pray specifically for those who need Jesus. Pray specifically. Make make a list. Be intentional about the people that you're praying for that need to know what a relationship with Jesus is all about. Ask the Holy Spirit to go before you to prepare them to hear the message of salvation. So be praying for people in your life. Number two, Share what God is doing. Uh, You can do this through uh, actual conversation, you know, actually talk to people. We don't do that a lot these days, but actually talk to people and share what God is doing. You might have some opportunities here and there. I know it's difficult. It's kind of weird sometimes to be like to break the ice and stuff. I got a little tip on that in a minute, but, but an easy way, if you're like me, you can push the share button on Facebook and you can share, you know, anytime the church posts something, you can share it. Uh, anytime, you know, you can, somebody else posts something. It doesn't have to be Stony Creek Church. Maybe, maybe you see something else that's really helping you and you want to share there. You want to type your own thing and share to the world around you. You know, we're, we're just coming out of this political season, right? It's all done. We don't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> that's a joke. We all know that it's going to keep going forever. But, uh, but, you know, my question is, do people know more about your political affiliation than they do about your love of Jesus? I hope not. It's okay to share anything you want, but, sh- but be overwhelming in your love of Jesus as you communicate to the world around you. Let people in your social circles know that you love Jesus and that hopefully you, you love your church. Uh, that's an easy way to do that. Number, number three here is invite others in. Sure, it's good to go out and invite others to come in here, but it's also good to invite others into relationship with Jesus. And and really, thirdly, you can look at this as, I want to invite others into my community. You know, maybe somebody, there's a new person here, you don't know, you didn't invite them, you didn't bring them, but you can have a conversation with that person and invite them into your community. You know, when, when somebody attends church, the number one reason why they come back is because they heard Ken Leslie preach a sermon. No, it's not. (laughs) No, it's not because of the message. It's not because of the amazing worship band or the, the cool lights or this great graphic here. No, people come back because they had a relational connection with another human being. I want to challenge you to take the easy risk. I call it an easy risk. Why? Because it feels risky, but it's really easy. Everybody wants this. Introduce yourself to somebody today. Just find somebody today that you don't know and say, hey, I got to introduce myself. My name is Ken. 
If you say that, that'd be a little awkward because my name is Ken. Your name's not Ken. But, but you know, introduce yourself. Give them your name and just say, hey. You can even say, make it, make it funny. Be like, all right, Ken told me I had to introduce myself to you today. Ha, ha, ha. We laughed. But you know what? <laughs> you made a connection. And that would be great. So I want to encourage you today, after you leave this service, spot somebody you don't know. They might have attended here longer than you. That's okay. But introduce yourself to them. And then lastly, make space for people. Make space for people. You know, like I said earlier, unlike the Pharisees in this passage, do whatever it takes to make space for people. And you're probably thinking, you're looking around, you're like, there's some space. I see some empty chairs. That's okay. 10 o'clock service, there was barely any chairs open. Um, so, you know, that's okay. But people aren't going to come to 10 o'clock and be like, oh, there was no space, I'll come back at the 1130. You know, that's okay. But we need to be thinking, how can we intentionally, even physically here, make some more space for people? You know, last week, Pastor Chris brought up how Stony Creek Church, in her mission to make more and better followers of Jesus, that we are taking this initiative to expand from two service times to three on Sunday morning. And we're planning on doing it starting March 2nd, 2025. So a couple things. You can think to yourself, this is way down the road. I'll think about it later when it comes to it. Well, don't waste time. Begin thinking and praying about how you are going to be involved in this. And I'm going to give you a just a little inside information. The service we're planning is at 8.30 a.m. So it's a lot early. You guys are like the 11.30 crowd. You're like, I ain't getting up any earlier to get to church, right? I understand. I get it. But still, everybody can play a role. It's going to be a big undertaking for everybody. And we want everyone to be active in some sort of way to see us really work together to make space for people. In fact, uh, our elders and our staff have gone around and visited a lot of the small groups and shared uh, the vision behind this and the heart behind why we want to do and kind of some practical things about this. And, and perhaps you missed that. You weren't in a small group or you didn't make it for that one. We've got this Wednesday um, a vision presentation that's happening. We call it a catch-all presentation because we just want to, we want to give it an opportunity for anybody to come and hear the heart and the, the really the vision behind uh, expanding to three services. And so you're going to come on that Wednesday and you're going to hear how you will play a part in this. Again, you know, last week uh, Chris passed out these commitment cards. It was in the program. I know there's none in the program this morning, but we've got more at the Welcome Center back there. And, and last week I loved it. I had people after service come and they bring it fully fold out and they're like, where do I turn it in? I'm like, that's awesome. Hold on to it. We're going to have a special time next Sunday, uh, the 24th here. I believe that that's the date. Next Sunday to all turn these in together. But we don't want you to just like fill it out and be like, yep, this is what I'm going to do. I want you to pray about what your role is going to be. Again, we want to see everyone active in some way to really see this, this happen in our church. You know, Chris spoke about the cost last week of, of what it's going to take to make this happen. I'm going to, just so you remember, the cost is zero dollars. That's the best part, right? It doesn't cost anything in financially. It's going to cost a lot of our time and our effort, which is probably more valuable than some money. But Chris talked about the cost of it. Today, I want to talk about, we're, we're talking about how to be intentional. And that's really the bottom section of this commitment card. And like I said, next, next, Wednesday, or next Sunday, Randy's going to speak, and we're going to have a time to, to turn these in. But, but if you're looking at this card, at the bottom it says, I will be more intentional to invite people to church as a way of life by doing one of the following. Person, have a personal conversation. Make an invitation. Check in on social media or liking and sharing church posts. I mean, anybody can do that. Come on, Right? You can, they could be like, that's my active role. Uh, you know, you can join the reach for the streets team that goes out on, on Saturdays and, and shares the gospel. You know, I want to I give you, there's a couple things on here that if you choose to fill one of these out, bring it next week, and we're going to have a special time to turn it in. 
we want to give you some tools to make it make this more beneficial just something that's an easy way for you to actively be in, involved uh, we've got a special gift we've got free hoodies for everyone that wants one to who, who says yep sign me up i want to i want to be committed to help out with what making this happen uh we, we've got these free hoodies they're amazing hoodies these are not the cheap hoodies you buy on timu or anything like this right uh you know it would spell stony with an e probably if it was so uh no knock to the other stony creek churches that use an e but uh so but it, these are good hoodies. You're going to love wearing this sweatshirt. You're going to be like, this is a good sweatshirt. I like it. I enjoy wearing it. It's not, you know, the El Cheapo or anything. Uh, so, but the best part about it, you know, the sweatshirt, you just put it on in the morning and you go about your daily life. And somebody at, you know, Meyer is going to say, hey, I've heard of that church. And you're going to be like, oh, my ice has been broken. I can, yeah, I go there. <laughs> and, and you should join me at Stony Creek Church. You know, it says it right there. And so, you know, this is just a, it's just an easy icebreaker uh, to, to do this or, or wear it out in the community and spot somebody else and be like, yeah, me too. You know, and, and that'd be great. You know, also, we've got something else for you. Uh, we're going to have these yard signs. Now, like I said, political season is over. Everybody's taking up their signs and put them, throwing them away. All the stuff is gone out of the yards. It's all clean. And now you can put your Stony Creek Church. I heart my church sign out. And, and it'll, be like, it'll be like a beacon of light that everybody sees in your neighborhood. You know, I would encourage you guys. We're going to have these for anybody who wants them to go and put out in your house. And I would encourage you. We're going to be excited next week. We're going to pick this stuff up. You're going to go home and you're going to put it out there. What this does this isn't just advertisement. This is a way for you to begin a conversation with your neighbors. You can be out raking your leaves, hopefully one last time maybe, uh, raking your leaves and getting rid of your lawn stuff, and your neighbor might see you out there like, hey, you go to your church, eh? And you start to talk with them. <laughs> you know, I, now here's, here's my tip. You get to get this next week. Put it out next week. Be out there, be excited about it, and then maybe, you know, take it in and put it away for the doldrums of winter when everybody hides in their house for the, you know, and, and then when it's like February comes around and people start creeping out their door and peeking out, put your sign back out. And then people be like, oh, there's a sign. Uh, spring is coming. And they'll be excited about it again. And so uh, this is just an opportunity to really begin conversations in your neighborhood. Again, it can be so easy to think someone else is going to do this. Someone else is going to wear their sweatshirt, put their sign out, and really more importantly, share Jesus with others. I'll let somebody else do it. You might say to yourself, yeah, hey, Ken, I don't, I don't have the gift of evangelism. I fumble over my words. You know what? I don't think I have the gift of evangelism either. But I know that doesn't give me an excuse to put away what Jesus told me to do, to go and make disciples, to make more and better followers of him. You know, imagine, imagine if every person here today said, I'm going to do whatever it takes to share Jesus with others. Imagine the kingdom impact. You know, sure, there'd be a bunch of people sitting here and it'd be, you know, there'd be friends invited. But imagine people coming to know Jesus and moving from death to life because you had the faith to do whatever it takes to share Jesus with them. I don't think, I don't think we've ever seen a revival like that in our area. And just imagine what God would do. Let me pray. I'm going to ask you to stand as we, as we pray, we're going to pray for the offering. Um, and, and then after the service, after the, the, we'll take some time to sing. Perhaps you've got a, a prayer need yourself. I would invite you, we'll have our prayer team down front. And they would love to, to pray with you or for you. Maybe you, you know, you've got some sickness going on, you need healing. Or you have a friend that you want to share Jesus with and you, wanna, you want some accountability on that. Whatever it is, I, I, I want to encourage you, after we sing this song together, take the opportunity to pray um, with one of our prayer team members. 
But let's pray for this morning's offering together. Heavenly Father, we ask you in this moment that we take seriously your charge to us to go and make disciples, to share you, Jesus, and the hope of your salvation with others, to share about the, the, your death on, on the cross and the fact that you paid our forgiveness of our sins by doing so, to share that you rose again and that you have life and you give life to all who follow. Lord, help us to do that. We pray for your Holy Spirit to go in us and to lead us on that and to go in others to really to bring them and draw them near to you. That they know of everything that Jesus has done. Father, I pray for our offering as we give our tithes, our, 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 our acts of worship here to you. I pray that you use that to really expand your kingdom. Use these, these gifts, these tithes, so that we can see your kingdom come here. Father, I pray that you um, just draw us near to you. We thank you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen.